I love that I can go into this conversation with you, Paul, with this energy. Silence is the best. Silence is the best. Silence is the best. That will change that quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, just to introduce you a little bit more in-depthly, because there's a lot to know about this human sitting next to me here. Um, so, Paul Hawken, you dedicated your life so far to sustainability, the climate, regeneration. I was also very happy and intrigued to find out that um, the human side of things and social justice has always been important to you. In the 1960s, he was part of the civil rights movement, working with Martin Luther King's team uh, on the nonviolent protest marches on Montgomery, which we have probably all heard of. Um, for years, you've been working on architecting reform on how business relates to the environment, and you founded several conscious businesses yourself. Um, you, you consulted with heads of states, with CEOs. You started the non-profit Project Drawdown um, that researched how global warming can be reversed. I'm sure all of us have also know of the book Drawdown, right? Yes. Um, but you've wrote several, you've written many books. Um, and now you're here on the occasion of your latest book. We know all about it now, Regeneration. And I've read it from beginning to end. I have the Dutch and the English version, and I was uh, very intrigued. And I have several questions that I would love to ask you. And after that, we'll open the floor to a couple of questions uh, from you as well. Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. So, um, in the book, as Carlos also pointed out, a lot of the, the undertone is really about interdependence and interconnectedness and how, as you put it in a podcast that I listened to, Jack Kornfield, um, this beautiful dance between the atmosphere, climate, the biosphere, and the miracle that we call life. And um, I wanted to ask you on a maybe very personal note, how you experience this magic and this miracle of life in your personal life. Um, I think we've all experienced it at some time. As a child, as an adult, at a certain moment and a certain experience, you know, and maybe we experienced it just in the ocean, you know, diving and seeing a whole other world that we hadn't known about or seeing um, the relationship between two birds or animals or between we saw this is this beautiful bee this bee doesn't know it's spreading life everywhere it just is a bee <laughs> you know and um, the, so the, the so simple acts you know of, of being present and I love the, what we just ha experienced because it was really about presencing being present right here together and I think that what that's the the what is always on offer you know, the, the living world. And the living world is just full of miracles. And to me, all you have to do is just slow down <laughs> and be there with it. And I've had many of those experiences, but they never happen by intention. Mm. You can't call them. Um, maybe shamans can and others I can't. But I think we all do and can, you know, just by slowing down and being quiet and waiting and just wait go to a forest and just wait don't decide don't identify don't try to figure out what's going on just be there and I remember once I was <clears throat> at a refuge center uh, as a caretaker there's nobody there and uh, high in the mountains it was 40 miles from the nearest town and no electricity, no t TV, no radio, no telephone, no nothing. Just, you know, a wood stove and a home and a, a lodge. And uh, <clears throat> what I decided to do was, because it's in a wilderness area, is to try to get lost every day. Mm. And just to head off in a direction, you know, I'm going to head off that way. And I didn't know where I was. I had never been there before. And once I got lost, and uh, I couldn't find my way back. <laughs> and uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I uh, sat down, it was getting dark, and I leaned against a tree. Um, I was a little tired, too. And that night was the most magical night <laughs> of my life, in the sense that 
I, I mean, there's noises around me everywhere. Things in the bushes, in the shrubs, in the leaves, in the aspen trees, you know. And and then waking up to what's called the dawn chorus too, you know, which mm, is yeah. all of a sudden. And you, 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 I wouldn't have done that on purpose, you know. Uh, I did it by accident, but there it was. Yeah. And uh, it was extraordinary in the sense of the once I was there and then just sitting in the dark. Uh, although a moon did come up later, uh, the animals and the creatures, many of whom I couldn't identify, I had no idea what I was listening to, but I had some guess, uh, felt safe. Mm. And they felt safe, you know, uh, no, he's okay. And, and so that sense of, um, what's the word, just like abundance and yeah. the, the beauty of what is around us that, you know, uh, that we, uh, have lost touch with, of course, you know, in urban environments and what we do in our cars and our freeways and so forth. And there it was. And so, I, I, yeah, it yeah. was kind of transcendent experience. Love that. Yeah. Get lost and slow down because mm -hmm. the miracles are everywhere. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to read a little ex excerpt of the book um, that also sketches the urgency or the, the overview of where we are. Um, and it says... One description of the current economic system is extractive. We take, we damn, we enslave, we exploit, we frack, we drill, we poison, we burn, we cut, we kill. The economy exploits people and the environment, and the ongoing cause of degeneration is inattention, apathy, greed, and ignorance. Climate change may leave people feeling as if they have to make a choice between saving the planet and their own happiness, well-being, and prosperity. Not at all. Regeneration is not only about bringing the world back to life, it is about bringing each of us back to life. It has meaning and scope. It expresses faith and kindness. It involves imagination and creativity. It is inclusive, engaging, and generous. And everyone can do it. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Part. That was the easy part. But I wanted to ask you, you know, when we, when we listen to this, can you just explain briefly to us how climate and regeneration are really two sides of the same coin? Um, I would just put it a little differently because, it, you know, it sounds like they are, you know, uh, kith and kin in that way. It's, I see it a little differently. Mm -hmm. First of all, um, to when you said, are you worried about climate? I'm not worried about climate because it doesn't exist. What does Paul mean? <laughs> it doesn't exist. Find it. What do you mean? <laughs> Where is it? Where is it? It does not exist. It's a description mm. of the relationship between warm air, warming air, and warming water. Thank you. A sci uh, there's a scientist here. Yeah. And, um, and that's a dynamic, and we have a dynamic right now, but find it. Hold it. Tackle it. Fight it. Combat it. That's what we're talking about, climate, right? Using all these male war and sports metaphors about something that doesn't exist. Mm. And so that's why I'm not worried about it, and that's why it's perfect because it's the perfect expression of the earth and the atmosphere and the biosphere are the same thing. And so climate systems are social systems. It's us. And the impacts that we're reading about, seeing, experiencing, so forth, are basically we're being homeschooled by mom. Hmm. The earth is homeschooling, it's giving us feedback. And saying, is this working for you? I'm like, okay, you, you, that river used to be there. It's not there. This, how, how, how's that working for you? I mean, in a sense, we are being schooled. We're being, getting feedback from this exquisite, beautiful, complex system called Earth. And any time you ignore feedback in a system, the system perishes. And it's not the Earth that's going to perish. It's civilization as we know it. And that's the system that's ignoring it. Uh, and um, so uh, I actually see climate, in the, but really look at, I look at it as weather, <laughs> which is real, mm -hmm. you know. 
And uh, again, as a offering, as a gift, you know, I'm not, don't want anybody to suffer, Lord knows, not, I don't mean that, but in the sense that that's what feedback is, always an offering, you have a high temperature, it's telling you something, do something, think, figure out what's the cause, it's just feedback from your system. And so, so when we look at it from that point of view, then we can say, ah, okay, you know. And really regeneration is innate to human beings. It's innate to all, it's the default mode of life. Um, every cell in your body is regenerating right now, right now, right now, right now, right now, and it won't stop until you die. And uh, so it's not as though it's out there somewhere, like, oh, what's regeneration? And uh, it's, the, like I said, the default mode of life. And it's also the default mode of our hearts and our, uh, what it means to be a human being. Because the reason we're here as Homo sapiens, this amazing hominid species that we are, is because we care. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's how we got here. We didn't get here by tooth and nail. We got here because we work together, we learn together, we're social beings, we're social species. Exactly. And, and so any time and all the time when you care about a person, about a place, about your children, about the children to come who aren't here yet, you know, about species, about animals, about bees, you know, about all pollinators, all, you just, um, the list is forever. When you care, that is regeneration because what is care? Care is about I'm supporting your life. I want your life to be better. I want your life. It's always about life. Yeah. It's not about status. Yeah. It's about that. And that is, so we all have it. So regeneration is about coming home. Here, this is mm. home, by the way. And you know, so th yeah. that's why, it, to me, it's such an important understanding rather than like sustainability is a concept, drawdown is a concept, it's, it's natural, a concept, yeah. Our generation like, is our natural state. But it's innate, yeah. yeah. I want to also ask or build on what you're saying now. Indeed, it's a social system that we're talking about. And in the book, uh, you say, social justice is not a sideshow to the emergency. Injustice is the cause. Yep. And you emphasize also many of the injustices that indigenous communities um, have suffered while it's these communities that have tens of thousands of years of worth of deep knowledge around the homelands and um, much of the areas that we need to conserve and protect. Um, as you say, it, it's human cultures that are innate, as intrinsic to a specific bioregion as our native plants and animals. So I want to ask you, um, because the injustices are ongoing, um, what's do we need to do to become followers to indigenous leadership? Yeah, the, the reason I was saying about climate injustice is sort of a new term last five, ten years. Oh, you know, it's injustice to people who are, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in low-lying land, you know, and their houses are not, you know, they're vulnerable to this and that and so forth. No question. But that, in a sense, is copping out to the fact that injustice is the cause, not the outcome of climate change. So that's really important mm -hmm. to understand. And the thing about indigenous uh, cultures and uh, indigenous civilization is that they have, if you identify them, talk to them, they've been in place for thousands of years in that place. Well, how is it that they are survived and thrived in that place for all those years? Because they know where they live. And we don't. Mm -hmm. by the way. But the thing is about Western science, which is formidable and amazing, but Western science is basically the, the, it, based on the idea that you, if you can't repeat something, it's not true. And indigenous is, science is observational science, which is nothing repeats in nature, ever. Not one oak tree is like any other oak tree. Not one oak leaf is the same as any oak leaf in the world just like our fingerprints are not identical, same with nature. And so observational science is really about pattern recognition as opposed to this is so and this is not so and, and you know, and it's not hypothetical. It's actually, and the, the only way you can have pattern recognition that's effective, because that's what it was, that's why those people can been, have been here for 5,000, 10,000, 
aboriginals in Australia for 40 to 50,000 years and so forth, they know so much, you know. And the song lines in the Aboriginal are really about places, what you do in, the, in, uh, in these different places, you know, in the migration, you know, human migration in this case, and, and what to eat, what not to eat, and what, if you're really hungry, well, you can cook this, but you have to cook in a certain way, otherwise it's going to poison you. This is the songs, you know, and these stories and this understanding, this exquisite understanding of place, uh, is there, and we came as colonists, you know, and we said, well, these people are literate, which is technically true. They didn't have a written language. The Mayans did. There were people who did, but but illiteracy for uh, was a blind spot for us because the uh, indigenous people have an extraordinary hippocampus, an extraordinary memory, you know, and they had it because they didn't have a written language. They didn't have Google. They had no place to look it up, and so. That memory was their ticket to survival, not just survival, but to thrival. Um, and so there, there's a Hindu, uh, Omaru Ibrahim is in the book, uh, amazing Chadian Wudabi woman who is a pastoralist and pastoralist culture. And her mother educated her in geospatial uh, mapping, and she works with the, the pastoralists to identify where water is and not to go there all at the same time and, you know, to work together so that the uh, thousand kilometer, you know, um, sort of um, uh, trip every day, not every day, every year that they take and so forth is harmonious with the environment and a changing environment. But she said something which is really important because we've heard that term about seven generations, you know, the indigenous people act in such a way that it's for seven generations ahead. And, and, and that's been, you know, basically talk about co-opting in the United States, the seven generation toilet paper, you know, you just like, I mean, yeah, talk about oh cultural God. appropriation. But when you talk to Hindu Amaru Ibrahim, she said, you know, the reason we can do that is because we know what happened seven generations ago. So it's not just, going forward, but it's like, we know seven past, so they're part of an unbroken lineage of life. Mm. And so for them, it's unthinkable to break the linkage. It's like, I'm part of, the, I'm the seventh generation, you know? And so, but that understanding is based on a completely different way of seeing the world, and people say, well, you know, they don't have a word for nature, that's why this and that. Most, most indigenous cultures do not because they don't understand what that word means. So how do we put indigenous leadership central listen. to our efforts? Listen, listen. Listen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, most of the, a lot of wisdom uh, uh, holders have been extirpated. They're extirpated, you know, we lost 90% of the indigenous population in mm. America, you know, within the first 100 years, 90%. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's just, that's a horror story. And, but there is that knowledge there now, today. And so I do feel we're at that turning point where we're realizing the extraordinary understanding and so forth. And um, when I, when I give an example about the Mi'kmaq who are um, Nova Scotia, the First Nations in Canada. And they have uh, the ability to, and do, in the first uh, uh, full moon in October, it's coming soon to a neighborhood near you. And, uh, and they go listen to the mother trees, the big, big, the, the big pine and um, the large ones. And they will listen to the sound of the wind soughing through the branches, all right? And that sound is, they make it a name. They name the tree after that sound. Now, we have three million words in English, and we can't do that. We don't have a word for the sound of the wind going through a tree that's specific to that tree. And that's the name of the tree, and they know that name. They can go to that tree 10 years later. They remember the name. They listen to the sound, and they can tell whether the tree is thriving or something's harmed it from the, that name. Mm. Now, what is that? Yeah. We think awareness, yeah. I mean, so th this is th that's just one yeah. tiny example or a huge example. There's so the, many. There's yeah. so many, yeah. you know, and that is there out the, in the world today yeah. with the Sami up north, or you know, basically the Aswar, or I mean, the, the, just all over the world, you know. Yeah.
and uh, yeah. I want to ask you one last little question so that we have a bit of time to take some of your questions as well, although I could listen to you forever. Um, and that is something that kind of struck me because uh, you say, or you, you quote in the book, um, Andrew, Andrew Huberman, who says that um, beliefs do not change our actions, right. actions change our beliefs. And this was interesting to me because I always tended to, to think that we need to replace some of the values in our culture. You know, if we don't put greed, if we replace greed by generosity, you know, or if we make sure that equality is something we all really are educated to, to value, then that would change something in our decisions and our actions. But, but, but this is quite the opposite. Yeah. Can you just in two sentences comment on this? Sure, he's a, a Stanford neuroscientist, and um, there's lots of data to support what he's saying there. But what's interesting is that um, climate science and climatology has really been based on using fear, uh, the word future existential threat. It's you know, a, a fancy word for be afraid. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, um, and then along with that fear is threat. I just said it, but threat, fear, you know, which is, produces stress or is ignored, depending. <laughs> um, and what they should have done is sort of go down the hall at Stanford or wherever they were and talk to the neuroscientists about how the brain works. And the brain doesn't care about future existential threats, not wired that way. It's an interesting idea. It just doesn't think that way because the people who are our ancestors are really good at current existential threat. That's why you're all here. Thank you, our ancestors. And so our brains are very wired in. So we have a climate movement that's based on future existential threat. And 98, 99% of the people say, oh, really? Thank you. I have a work to do. I have a mortgage to pay. I have children to raise. I have a farm. To, I mean, they, they deal with life as it is. And if we as a movement aren't about, and we should be, because the climate solutions, the solutions to reversing global warming make life better for everyone except people who are super rich. So who cares about them? And, <laughs> and, and so instead of focusing on fear, using blame and shame and guilt and this and fear, which is interesting, I'm not saying it's incorrect scientifically. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it doesn't work. Mm. And what works is to really reach out to understand that our role is to create more life. And that's a very practical thing. It's not just, you know, plant a tree or, you know, create a forest. It's about a human being, mm. a child, you know, a couple, a family, a cult, you know, um, migrants. I mean, and, and so that is what we're being called to do. That is what the solutions to reversing global warming do. Mm. That's what they're about. And we would want to do them if we were clueless about the atmosphere. Look at those solutions and just think about them, look at them, every one of them going, yep, better, 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 mm, better, better. Yeah. You don't have to be a climate scientist to understand that those are basically an invitation of humanity and the brilliance and the inventions and the techniques and the technologies and the, you know, that we have created you know, as a collective to basically reimagine who we are and life on Earth. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I find you very inspiring and wise and fearless. I find you inspiring. I don't know. The, I, I love the exercise we did, everybody standing up. I just thought that was so, so in, instructive. and. <laughs> Great. Yeah, it really was. You know. Easily, yeah. Easy to impress. <laughs> no, joke. Um, I, I mean, Paul is giving us like a beautiful podcast per, per question <laughs> as an answer. Uh, so I want to ask a few people with burning questions to uh, wait. We have one, two, max three. Yeah. Okay. We have one question here. Okay. Please this keep is, it short. Um, for me, it's a difficult one. Um, when I read the book, like um, I left the Netherlands when I was 15, went to London, Africa, Southern Africa, and then Brazil. I just came back with Corona. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I was reading the book, and especially about the indigenous people. And at some point, I was like, 
holy shit, I'm indigenous to the Netherlands. I had never conceptualized that mm -hmm. until reading the book. And I'm like, yes, but you're white and male and you shouldn't be appropriating a culture here. Mm -hmm. um, but like, aren't we indigenous? Don't we have clogs? Like, how do you... Like, so, so what's your question? My question is... Um, Am I indigenous? <laughs> no. Um, basically, yeah. What, how do you, what do you make of this sort of confusion? The indigenous to the I, I define indigeneity as, the, uh, as what emerges from people who stay in basically one region, one place, uh, 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 over an enduring amount of time. In other words, it has, it's actually the understanding that emerges from that, you know, and especially for cultures that aren't bringing in. I just heard from Prince Carlos that you, you know, basically uh, export 75% of everything you produce here, but you sp import 70% of everything you consume. Mm -hmm. That's not indigenous, okay? <laughs> yeah, and so uh, th to me, indigeneity is that, that the, the, the exquisite, you know, understanding of place. And, and it's interesting because there was a, uh, uh, I'm writing a book called The Book of Carbon right now. It's called The Love Story, okay? It's not about, you know, and it's just, I'm having fun. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, the thing is that there, there, the, 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 the number of things we eat, I don't know about, you know, Holland, I don't, I know in the United States, you know, 90% of what we eat is 12 foods. 12, okay, there's 30,000 edible foods on planet. And we eat 12 of them, you know, nice, nice going. And, but if you look at the diet of the indigenous people all over the world, I mean, it's a long, long list. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, you know, w what they discovered and how they prepare it and how they cook it, how they knew how to avoid certain aspects of certain food and soak it to do this or whatever, you know, to make it edible. How to eat acorns. I mean, obviously, that was a big food in North America. So, you know, in terms of, you know, you want to eat the tannin? No, we don't. So we're going to cook it this way, soak it that way, do this, and so forth, you know. And so that's indigeneity, which is how to live in our place, you know, and rather than how to exploit it, which is what you're doing here, by the way, like crazy. And then you're shipping it out, and you get money, and then you take the money, and you buy what somebody exploited someplace else. That's a really nice reality yeah. check. <laughs> So the question to ask ourselves maybe is how do we become indigenous again? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, the next question was there in the back. Yes. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the difference between uh, the scientific method and indigenous knowledge being uh, more observational. I was wondering, do you have any examples or ideas on how to bridge the two together without falling into cultural appropriation and the exploitation of indigenous populations? Uh, yeah, it's a really good question. And somebody says, speak better in the mic, OK. <laughs> well, uh, um, first of all, is to listen and to, to find out, to listen, to take it in, uh, as opposed to there, there's in, um, in Blessed Unrest, a book I wrote, but um, there was uh, Australian scientists are going to Palau, uh, and they thought they knew everything about fish, and this is about fishing, and this, and now they had so much science, and they were blown away by what the uh, Palauans knew about the moon, tides, fish. I mean, this exquisite understanding that just blew them away, you know. And so, but they were blown away because they actually asked. <laughs> Mm, yeah. And listened and didn't come in like an Aussie saying, you know, this is what's happening, you know, in your fisheries. You know, they didn't say that. And th I think that's what's happening right now more and more in science, you know, is that as somebody said the shamans are becoming scientists and the scientists are becoming shamans. There's a, really an explosion in Western science, so called Western science and biology, particularly, of understanding life in a way that is much more in accord, if not exactly in accord with indigenous understanding, which is it's all alive, it's all intelligent, you know, and it's all connected. <laughs> I mean, I don't think any indigenous person would say it that way. It sounds like a very white thing, but nevertheless, 
essentially, if you listen, that's what they're saying. They wouldn't say it so declaratively. Um, so we're at that state, you know, and I, the, one of the pieces, and I read science, uh, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm a journalist, I read science, and have such respect for science. And one of the things that just, a paper I just saw two weeks ago was from Adamansky at the Royal Society uh, in, in, in London. Um, and basically what they've discovered is that the micro muscular mycorrhizal networks, you know, in the soil, you know, fungi, it's, fung it's fungus, you know and uh, are actually talking. And with electrical signals, they've d discovered they have a vocabulary. They have sentence structure. Their sentence structure is more morphologically complex than ours, <laughs> than Indo-European languages. And the rate at which they speak or communicate or whatever you want to call it, they're not speaking, of course, you know, it's electrical signals, is extraordinary. So that's the fungus. <laughs> Nobody knows what to do that. They're not questioning his results or his data or his interpretation so much as going, holy whatever. You know, what does that mean? What, what, is, what are we standing on outside, you know, when we're on the soil? You know, it was a medium, you know, from 1910, you know, after Huber Bosch methods and MPK, it's just the stuff, you know, which we're going to use to grow things. And now, then it became the microbiome. Oh, it has a microbiome. There's bacteria everywhere, just like us, and so forth. And now, we're seeing it as the most extraordinary living organism, about which his discovery makes us understand we know even less, not not more, less. And, and I think that's the threshold. And that humility and that understanding, and I'm sure indigenous people would be fascinated by that science at the same time they're saying, yeah, we, that makes sense to us, yeah, of course. You know. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We had one last question in the middle, and I wanna ask you to both keep the question and the answer short, because we have a lot of people lined up. Yes, you were the one, yes. Great. There's a mic for you. I want to thank you, um, Paul, for um, the, the, um, the way you took us into your way of thinking. And I feel like you're expanding language, our understanding of language, and our own reduced way of thinking often. I'm working as a consultant in education, and I feel so much the urge from what you say and what you do to not copy our old way of thinking mm. um, in the new generation. I don't know if you wrote anything on that, but what, uh, what should we do in education differently from what we do now? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I mean, the most important thing you do with children is to, in my opinion, in terms of education, is have them fall in love with the living world. You know? And it's really important not to introduce to them at an early age, you know, the things that are going wrong. Because you're instilling fear. And, you know, we protect what we love, but we don't necessarily protect what we fear or, you know, it's, it's, it's just the wrong entry point for a child, you know. And so our educational system, we've tried to develop curriculum in the USGS. I mean, there's standards, the curriculum standards in the United States. It's very, very difficult because it's empirical. It has to be empirical, otherwise you can't introduce it into the schools. Um, but then you have, I think, did they come out of Germany, the forest schools? I don't know. There's forest schools now all over the world where basically that's the school. You know, I mean, and if it rains and you put something up to, you know, stay out of the water. But I mean, you stay there day after day after day after day. That's how you learn. That's where you learn, you know. And I've met some of the kids who are doing that. They were effing brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. I mean, what they can identify, what they know, what the experiments they've done, you know. I mean, you know, it doesn't look like, uh, you know, uh, pond scum to them. It looks like a living organism, you know. And they can identify it and they can name it and they talk about interactions and so forth. And so they're div this is a whole new uh, uh, way of educating our children. And the thing that we've discovered in, in a few schools in the United States, and especially in schools for, and I know this is too long, but, mm -hmm. but uh, 
approaching you. Uh, yeah, I know you are. Uh, children, are uh, children at risk, you know, who are, you know, teen pregnancy or crime or drugs or whatever and so forth. And a, a, a friend in Pittsburgh opened up a school and basically it was all about art. All art. These are kids who weren't writing very well, had learned English very well, had, you know, math, etc. They just, they just blew it. They failed. They weren't doing well. They had bad home situations, etc. Okay, art, you know, rap, theater, song, whatever it was, dance, and so forth. And what happened is, for the first time, they felt they had value in the world. That there was something in them that was valuable and appreciated. And once they felt that, then they said, well, I want to keep going with my, my career, art, design, music, this and that. And they said, well, you got to, there's a college. Said, what do I have to do to get into college? Well, you have to learn this and this and this. They said, bring it on. And, and so the same thing with our children is like education, I don't know about yours, mine was just, just a miserable just misery for 12 years, you know. And I mean, and uh, I, I was, had the worst record of anybody. I had a, a, a attendance record, you know, which is, you know, I was gone maybe 60% of the time, you know. And uh, I couldn't stand it, you know. But I just feel like, you know, we have this opportunity, again, to your question, to your point, you know, which is these divine beings that have come into, you know, our presence, you know. They are divine. They are, they're heavenly. They're extraordinary. They have minds that are just, they learn the most, the youngest, than they do as they get older, you know. And, and, uh, and so that's the thing about saying that we're being homeschooled. Well, let's you know, let them be homeschooled as well, you know, and, uh, and they will teach us so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Can we sometimes do like a 24-hour interview? <laughs> I know there's so many more questions in the, in the room, and we have so much more for you that's going to happen here on stage. So we won't have uh, time right now, but I want to ask you to show some of your kindness and care and appreciation for Paul in a very warm, warm applause. <laughs>